In 1888, Connecticut exemplified the growing distinction between city and country in most of the eastern United States. New Haven and Hartford featured the high technology wonders of the telephone and electricity. Fast railroads brought fresh beef from the slaughterhouses of Chicago to industrial centers. It was an age of rapidly evolving convenience, at least for middle class and wealthy city residents. Poor immigrants huddled in teeming slums. Out in the countryside, however, the daily rhythm of life had changed little since the 17th century. Farmhouses did not have telephones. Oxen and dairy cattle grazed in the yard. While country life was deeply rooted in the seasonal variations of weather, the vulnerability of modern cities to catastrophic storms had not been tested. A latticework of wires strung high above roads dominated the cityscape. Daily deliveries of groceries and coal made storage of food unnecessary. But in the middle of March 1888, the idea of technology as progress had been driven to such extremes that it became part of the secular gospel. That idea would be called into question in the aftermath of the greatest blizzard to hit Connecticut. Over three days between March 12th and 14th, almost four feet of snow fell on the state. Gale force winds created drifts that reached heights of 20 feet or more. The storm killed dozens of people, stranded trains and left the state cities isolated from within and without. The first week of March 1888 was generally pleasant and pointed toward an early spring. On March 10th, the United States Signal Services published its forecast for Sunday, March 11, 1888. A weather map showed two storms moving eastward from the north and south, but the official forecast for New England called for fresh to brisk southeasterly winds, slightly warmer, fair weather, followed by rain. The Signal Corps Weather Office closed at midnight on Saturday. It would not reopen until Monday. Between Saturday and Sunday nights, the weather changed dramatically. Ship captains off the Atlantic coast became alarmed over a sharp drop in barometric pressure Sunday afternoon and headed for port. The cloud deck over New England began to thicken as two separate storms converged. By midnight Sunday, the storm began to flick its easterly wing at New England. A high pressure system from Canada, meanwhile, fed cold air into the storm system and held it in place to the west. To the east, another high pressure system blocked the storm from moving any further. The blizzard of 1888 had begun. In Bridgeport, snow began piling up just after midnight. To the east, in New Haven, a blinding snowfall began at about 2.30 a.m. Monday. Within 24 hours, the blizzard would drop 28 inches of snow on the Elm City. Bristol, Danbury, Hartford, Middletown, and all other cities in the state would be covered in a blizzard that by now stretched the imagination. Monday, March 12, 1888. A terribly snowy time, also very cold at night. I was up until 12 o'clock, the greatest snowstorm I ever saw, Angeline Banks. About 4 p.m., Ed thought he would go home. He got as far as the next house and then came back, said he couldn't see or breathe because the snow was so thick. It was Wednesday before he got home on wooden snowshoes. E.H. Cook. Tuesday the 13th, the snow continues to fall as if there is no end to it. We went to bed with shovels in the house for fear of being snowed in, and it was well that we did, as the snow is as high as the door and about four feet high on the veranda. It took three of us to dig to the barn, drifts eight and ten feet high. We tunneled through one that was too big to dig out. There was no sign of life outside. George Bradley. As the snow kept falling into Tuesday, 
Winds whipped up drifts that piled onto buildings and lampposts. Telegraph and telephone poles groaned under the weight of the snow and the pressure of ravaging winds. Cities in the east had become isolated without transportation or communication. People were stranded everywhere, sometimes far from home. Many could not fathom the terror. A woman later asked the Signal Corps if the storm meant the start of another ice age. Some workers left their jobs and trudged home through the fierce winds and blowing snow. At the Pratt & Whitney Tool Company in Hartford, employees labored outside the factory in freezing cold to stamp out a mile-long path so coal could be delivered to keep machinery running. Trains stopped dead as drifts buried the tracks and stalled any movement forward or backward. Railroad companies hired hundreds of shovelers to clear the tracks, but the drifts kept piling up around their stranded trains in South Norwalk, Darien, and elsewhere. The impassable tracks and city roads caused an immediate crisis in the delivery of life's necessities. Oxen carts brought milk to Hartford, Meriden, and other cities from outlying farms, but delivery to homes from there was impossible. As the Great Blizzard began to lose its energy early on Wednesday, March 14th, people began to measure just what had happened to them. In New Haven, Waterbury, and Thomaston, 42 inches of snow had fallen. In Cheshire, it was 40 inches. Bristol absorbed 38 inches. Similar amounts stretched across the state. Oh, the snow, the beautiful snow, filling the sky and the earth below, over the housetops, over the street, over the heads of the people you meet, dancing, flirting, skimming along. Beautiful snow, it can do no wrong. John Whitaker Watson, Beautiful Snow. John Whitaker Watson's poem, Beautiful Snow, was popular among teachers in post-Civil War schoolhouses. Students everywhere, it seemed, had to memorize it. During the blizzard of 1888, Watson was hanged in effigy outside the United States Hotel in downtown Hartford. Passers-by pelted it with snowballs. The Canaan Messenger later offered a reward of a nickel for the arrest and conviction of the person who wrote Beautiful Snow. On March 14, 1888, the Hartford Current published its commentary on the storm. It is probable that a storm such as this, had it come a hundred years ago, would not have caused a fiftieth part of the inconvenience that has now come. It is the boasting and progressive 19th century that is paralyzed, while the slow-going 18th would have taken such an experience without a ruffle. There is no railroad any longer, no telegraph, no horse car, no milk, no delivery of food at the door. It is only a snowstorm, but it has downed us. The Hartford Current, March 14, 1888. A late winter thaw arrived by the end of the week, turning mountains of snow into slush. The coal and food distribution crisis had melted away as well. Trains resumed a normal schedule, Within a month, evidence of the storm remained only in photographs, diaries, news accounts, and in the memories of people who lived through it. They called it King Blizzard. <laughs>